Welcome aboard. Welcome to another tour. Today, we are at what was once the Oneida County Airport. Now technically closed, but we will depart from here in the simulator. We are just south of Rome, New York. We will be finding the site of the infamous music festival Woodstock 99 held here from Friday, July 23rd to Sunday, July 25th, 1999. If you are not familiar with the story, let's just say things went sideways that weekend in 1999 and sealed the fate for any further Woodstock festivals. If you're new to dude tours, what we do here is we take locations associated with interesting stories and we find them here in the flight simulator. We're not creating any actual flights. Today in the simulator, we are flying the Cessna 152. The Cessna 152 is an American two-seat, fixed, tricycle gear general aviation aircraft, and it's used primarily for flight training and personal use. The first model year was 1978. Some of them were delivered in 1977. It was an update to the Cessna 150 model, and the production of the 152 ended in 1985. The plane is started. Let's take a look at the flight plan. Really short flight today from where we are, just north to what is now the Griffiths International Airport. Here at this airport, it's now actually the New York State Preparedness Training Center. It was formerly the Oneida County Airport here in Oneida County, New York. And we are six miles or 9.7 kilometers northwest of downtown Utica, New York. Airport operations were moved from here in 2007 to the Griffiths International Airport, and that's our destination today. This airport here opened in the 1950s. The last airline to operate out of this airport was a small regional airline, Commute Air, and they ceased operations here in 2002. When in operation, this airport had the code KUCA, and it had two runways. The site was eventually purchased by the state of New York and became the site of the New York State Preparedness Training Center, SPTC, which is a first responder training facility. It's a realistic training venue with a swift water and flood training venue, a 45,000 square foot cityscape complex, a simulated trailer park, and an urban search and rescue simulator. The site offers wooded areas, open fields, roadways, and more for the training of all types of rescue and response scenarios. In our flight to Griffiths International Airport, it's about four miles north of here or six and a half kilometers. And that Griffiths International Airport is a former military base, which is where today's story took place in 1999. Let's get the plane in the air. Most everyone has heard of the Woodstock Music and Art Fair held in 1969, known to most people simply as Woodstock. Three days of peace and music on a dairy farm owned by Max Yasger. There were a few attempts to recreate that experience with later music festivals, and they didn't turn out as planned. If you want to know more about the original 1969 Woodstock Festival, we did a tour of that site, and I'll put a link in the description below. Utica Tower, dude 101 ready at runway 27 north departure. Dude 101 altimeter, 2 niner decimal niner, 2 and 2 a tree, a tree. Departure to the north approved. Cleared for takeoff runway 27. <laughs> Why would you? Three days, over 40 bands, and a lifetime of experiences. The weekend of July 23rd in Rome, New York, Woodstock 99. Tickets now. now. Don't wait. Visit Ticketmaster or call the Woodstock 99 hotline. This is it. Woodstock 99. In 1994, the promoters of the original Woodstock planned a Woodstock Silver Anniversary Festival in Saugatees, New York. Woodstock 94 was in partnership with the entertainment company Polygram. One of the issues with the original Woodstock in 1969 was the larger than expected crowd and the traffic that went along with that. And the fact that the crowd was too large to manage, the event ended up to be primarily a free concert, costing the promoters millions in losses. To avoid those same issues for Woodstock 94, they announced an elaborate plan to sell all the tickets in advance and then to transport all the concert goers to and from the festival site on buses. 
The promoters in 1994 sold 164,000 tickets, and like the original concert, the crowd at Woodstock 94 turned out to be over 350,000 people. The size of the crowd was larger than the concert organizers had planned for, again, and failing to secure the venue, again, they were unable to restrict those without tickets from entering. Another major issue was that when the attendees arrived or left and then returned to the site, they couldn't enforce the policy which restricted attendees from entering with food and beverages. This policy had been put in place to ensure the profit from the food vendors. These issues in 1994 would play a key role in how Woodstock 99 would play out. Michael Lang, one of the original Woodstock promoters, joined forces with concert promoter John Scher of the Metropolitan Entertainment Group and entertainment accountant Ossie Kilkenny to put on the 30th anniversary edition of Woodstock, billed as three more days of peace and music, and how wrong that turned out to be. We are approaching Griffiths International Airport, and just beyond it is Rome, New York. John Scher is a successful concert promoter from New Jersey. He attended Long Island University, pursuing a political science degree. That's where he ended up working on a concert committee and found his calling. He left college in his sophomore year and went on to a successful career in the entertainment industry. Ossie Kilkenny is a top music industry accountant who's worked with some of the biggest groups in the world, such as U2. Michael Lang, who's best known for Woodstock 1969, was born in Brooklyn, New York. He moved to Florida for a few years, and after attending a few music festivals, he began promoting music festivals himself. He was one of the promoters of the 1968 Miami Pop Festival. He later moved to Woodstock, New York, and he would become the public face of that 1969 Woodstock Festival. We will take a few passes around the airfield. This is where Woodstock 99 took place, and it's also our final destination today. After suffering the financial losses of Woodstock 94, the promoters of the 1999 festival knew that they had to keep control of access to the event, as well as ensure the food and beverage sales did not suffer from outside food and beverages making their way into the venue. Michael thought he had found the ideal site with the ability to easily secure the site. It turned out to be a decommissioned military base in Rome, New York, 100 miles from the location of the 1969 festival. The promoters believed that a former military site was perfect. The Griffiths Air Force Base in Rome, New York had been closed in 1995 and the local officials thought allowing a concert to take place there would be good for the local economy that had suffered from the base closure. In 1941, the U.S. War Department began looking for an area to construct an air depot in central New York. Construction began on the 2nd of August, 1941. The facilities were completed in February of 1942, and flight operations on the Rome Air Depot airfield began on the 18th of February in 1942. The base was renamed to Griffiths Air Force Base in 1948 to honor Lieutenant Colonel Townsend Griffiths, a Buffalo, New York native, and he was the first U.S. airman to be killed in line of duty in the European theater of World War II. Rome is a city here in Oneida County, New York, and it's located in the central part of the state. The mayor of Rome, New York at the time was Joseph Griffo. The mayor, who was a big supporter of bringing the three-day festival to Rome, played a critical role in the negotiations with the organizers during the planning of the event. He later acknowledged that during July 23rd through 25th of 1999, he and his staff asked the promoters few questions about issues such as sanitation, public safety, and the vending, which he said were the responsibilities of the organizing company, Woodstock Ventures, and the Oneida County Department of Health. And there starts one of the many variables that went into creating this disaster. As the Netflix documentary about the festival calls it, train wreck. The military base was an unforgiving venue for a music festival with miles of asphalt and unkept grass, and the size resulted in long distance between the stages, water stations, and the portable toilets. The site chosen was a vast asphalt site with little shade, and it was on a weekend that brought temperatures reaching as high as 102 degrees Fahrenheit or 39 degrees Celsius. Yeah, this was a mistake. The first issue was definitely the site selection. Next was the decision to sell the rights to food and beverage sales to a third party. This led to the promoters not having any control over the prices. Extreme temperatures and $4 bottles of water did not sit well with many of the attendees. That would be over $7 a bottle in 2022. There were a few free water stations, but the need for water in these conditions and a crowd of 200,000 plus people and 10,000 staff members made the lines and wait times unbearable. The frustration of long lines for water led to some of the water lines leading to these stations being smashed and causing flooding around the site. As with the water, 
food costs were excessive as well. A single slice of pizza was $12, or so over $21 in 2022. Many of the attendees had reported that their water and other food had been taken from them as they entered the festival. The second issue was definitely access to water and the cost of food and beverages. It may not have led to what occurred, but the security arranged by the promoters sure didn't prevent it. Security for the festival was intentionally not local or state law enforcement. The organizers had cut costs in the matter of security as well. Michael Lang said that he didn't want any representatives of authority or armed personnel to be present, as that would go against the spirit of the festival. And so they had appointed a group of young men and women to be part of what they called the Peace Patrol. The promoters hired Ken Donahue, a former New York City police chief, and Dan Flynn, he was the former Dade County or Miami police chief, and he put them in charge of maintaining order at the event. They oversaw a total security force of 3,100 people. Besides patrolling the perimeter, the guards patrolled the site in search of illegal contraband. These individuals were essentially given a chance to attend the event, get paid a small fee, and all they had to do was take care of maintaining order. Along with the absence of any sort of experience in security for most of the Peace Patrol, they hardly had any accountability or supervision on them, and quickly many indulged in all the activities that they were there to prevent. The third issue was definitely the lack of professional security. The festival's lineup played a role as well. Hard rock and new metal, which is heavy metal mixed with hip-hop, folk, or grunge, had become extremely popular at the time, especially with young, mostly white males. Among the acts signed for the festival were Korn, Creed, Kid Rock, and Limp Bizkit. Other bands were Offspring, Metallica, Rage Against the Machine, whose sound was abrasive and whose lyrics were anger and rage filled. This generation, who had experienced the anger and melancholy of Nirvana, were now being bombarded with the tension and energy with the rise of new metal. The youth of the late 90s looked nothing like those of the 60s at the original Woodstock. The fourth issue could possibly be the lineup. Conditions at the event you know, things like I mentioned, the heat and the cost of food and water were all enhanced by the overall conditions. As the festival went on, the lack of preparation or at least execution of simple logistics became evident. The trash piled up and blew around in what some described as a trash tsunami. The water from the broken water pipes started mixing with the overflowing portable toilets that were becoming unusable in an unimaginable sea of human waste. Some unknowing attendees began sliding, diving, and bathing in this disgusting sea of mystery mud. This led to most of the water stations becoming contaminated, causing some to get sick. I guess the fifth issue could be summed up as trash, mud, and shit. Attendees later described how the site morphed into a Lord of the Flies atmosphere from the anger at the conditions and the treatment of the attendees by the promoters. In addition to the lineup, there was an undercurrent of anger that the music industry had been overtaken by corporate greed. The conditions were believed to be a direct result of this greed, and the presence of MTV at the event broadcasting a pay-per-view special of the three days added to this notion. It was hot as hell. You know, excuse my language, but there were like no water, man. It was like they're trying to kill us in here, but, you know, and everybody was mad about that. MTV, or Music Television, is an American cable company that used to actually be related to music, but not so much these days. It's believed that the MTV cameras glorified and possibly encouraged some of the behavior at the event. The sixth issue is anger at the corporate greed in the music industry. 
It's easy to blame the genre of music. It was an angry time in rock, dominated by the fury of Limp Bizkit and Insane Clown Posse. But the promoters did themselves no favors, booking only three women, one per day on the main stage, and putting Limp Bizkit, Rage Against the Machine, and Metallica all in a row at the end of a long, hot day on Saturday. Anger, dehydration, and the festival's organizers' apathy were the fuel for what would come by the end of the festival. By the time Limp Biscuit hit the stage, shortly after 8 p.m. on Saturday, the crowd was breaking off pieces of plywood from surrounding walls and using them to crowd surf. During Limp Biscuit's performance of their song, Break Stuff, people started trying to literally break down things in the area, including the massive sound and lighting tower. The workers from the tower had to be rescued as the unruly crowd breached the security walls. During the performance, MTV cameras caught a man groping a topless woman. By the festival's end, at least four incidents of sexual assault were being investigated. Later that night, inside a hangar used for electronic music raves, an unidentified individual drove a truck through the crowd during Fat Boy Slim's set. The entire scene became chaotic and people climbed up on top of this slow-moving vehicle. Fat Boy Slim's set was abruptly ended and he was rushed out of the venue. When security got to the van, they opened it. They found an unconscious girl inside and a man standing over her. This most likely was one of the many sexual assault allegations to come out of this event. Of the 44 people arrested at Woodstock 99, only one was charged with sexual assault. What had initially begun as a few acts of vandalism was spurred on by the overall conditions that the attendees were experiencing, attributed to the horrible mismanagement by the organizers. People had also been partying for days now with little or no sleep, and this too perhaps played into driving them towards the violent behavior. While many attendees headed out and left the festival at the first of light on Sunday, having had enough of the conditions, this actually just left the most hardcore festival goers behind. The third day, with blistering heat, no shade, no safe drinking water, horrid conditions and price gouging would all lead to Woodstock 99's less than grand finale. Closing the festival on the final night was the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and the remaining crowd was still very riled up. During their set, the promoters had decided to hand out thousands of candles to the crowd for a candlelight vigil. The vigil was intended to pay tribute to those who had died due to gun violence. Woodstock 99 took place just months after the Columbine shooting. Given the destruction that had taken place throughout the weekend, the candles were well-intentioned, but (laughs) ultimately a terrible decision. The audience used the candles to start giant, raging fires. The Red Hot Chili Peppers were asked to calm the crowd down before their encore. Instead, they proceeded by covering Jimi Hendrix's song, Fire. In his 2004 book, Scar Tissue, singer Anthony Kiedis discussed this event from his point of view. As they were warming up for their set, Anthony said that Jimi Hendrix's sister, Janie Hendrix, the CEO of the Hendrix Estate, came backstage and asked the band to do a cover of a song by her brother, which they hadn't planned on doing. The Red Hot Chili Peppers set was supposed to be followed by a tribute to Jimi Hendrix, which apparently had fallen through, and she was mortified that Woodstock would forget him, Anthony recalled. Jimi Hendrix's performance at the original Woodstock is iconic. Anthony continued, It had been a long time since we played a Hendrix song, so our first inclination was to say no. But she kept telling us how much it would mean to her, so ten minutes before we were to go on stage, we decided to do Fire. They reviewed and relearned the song quickly before going on stage. When it was time for our encore, he said, we started into Fire. Not because there were fires raging, but as a tribute to Jimmy. After that, they left the stage, went to the airport, flew to New York City, and checked into their hotel, not realizing what had taken place after they finished their set. Griffiths Tower, Dude 101, is two miles northwest, 1,200 feet, with Charlie to land. Dude 101, Griffiths Tower. Make straight in runway 15. Clear to land runway 15. The final act on the third night was always supposed to be the Red Hot Chili Peppers, but there was a long-running rumor that the organizers had planned some big surprise at the end of the show. Many rumors of who the surprise act was going to be had circulated throughout the event. When the Red Hot Chili Peppers act was over, the remaining crowd realized that there was no surprise act awaiting them and that the festival was actually over, which drove them crazy. And that's when they began rioting and setting trailers, buses, and cars on fire. Twelve trailers, some with gasoline or propane in them, were looted and set on fire. Some exploded, but they were all burnt to the ground. People started pulling down other towers and cranes and structures. 
The vendor area was heavily vandalized as well, as people looted goods and money and even tried to break open the ATM machines to take the cash. Dude, 101 exit runway, when able. We are on the ground here at Griffiths International Airport, formerly Griffiths Air Force Base. Griffiths International Airport has the airport code KRME, and it's a public airport located here one mile or about 1.6 kilometers east of the city of Rome, New York. Finally, waves of state police arrived and drove everyone out. The entire Air Force base was trashed, and the scenes from the next morning were a sight to behold. It looked very similar to a war zone. Damaged structures, trash visible across the entire area, and burnt out vehicles. Some still had smoke coming out of them. The aftermath of the festival turned out to have three people who died while attending Woodstock 99. Two at the event site and one on their way back home after being struck by a car. And this was probably the final nail in the coffin of any future Woodstock festivals. That's the story of Woodstock 99, which took place here at the Griffiths Air Force Base near Rome, New York. That's what contemporary was. Do you think there'll ever be another Woodstock? There always could be another Woodstock. I mean, it's, you know, I've just learned never to say never about that. Let's find a place to park the plane and we'll take a look around. The price of today's tour is pretty reasonable. If you've not already, could you reach down and hit that subscribe button? I would appreciate it. It lets YouTube know you enjoy the content. Griffiths Airport covers an area of 1,680 acres, and it has one runway. It's runway 1533, and it's 11,820 feet by 200 feet. 